segregation to 1900. Between the end of Reconstruction and 1900, the calls of freedom suffered two landmark defeats. The first in 1883 when the U.S. Supreme Court declared the public accommodation section of the Civil Rights Act of 1875 unconstitutional. The second in 1896 when the Plessy versus Ferguson ruling made separate but equal the law of the land. These decisions opened the floodgates to a host of state segregation statutes and left African Americans. In the words of President James Garfield, 1881 on the middle ground between slavery and freedom. Although Kentucky accepted black freedom, neither the leadership nor the masses of white Kentuckians were willing to concede black equality. Segregation was imposed one law at a time and within a few years, Kentucky law required segregation and accommodations, theaters, ballparks, racetracks, and public transportation. Social domains that unlike schools had not always been segregated before. African Americans across the state united to oppose the 1892 separate coach law but after the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the controversial statute in 1900, civil rights for Kentucky African Americans had, for all practical purposes, ceased to exist. The only crucial exception was a franchise in Kentucky African Americans, largely because their numbers were too small to represent a threat to white domination and never lost the ability to exercise their right to vote. By 1900, the color line had been drawn through all walks of American life, a line that barred blacks from all places and spaces in which there might even be the appearance of equality with whites. These laws became a new and subtle question standard for race relations in Kentucky and throughout the nation and African Americans had reached what historian Ray Kirk Logan termed the nadir, the lowest point in African American history. So historian Rayford Logan says that 1900 was the nadir era of African American history, 1900. Right after Plessy versus Ferguson killed any chance of reconstruction having any type of chance of victory. By trial and error, imitation and invention, Louisville's black leadership developed a two-pronged strategy to meet the daunting challenges of the post-reconstruction era. First, to make separate as equal as possible, and second, when possible, to attack and breach the walls of segregation. Black Louisvillians had several key assets in executing this strategy. By 1900, Louisville had gained a reputation as a city in which racial compromise was sometimes possible. African Americans represented nearly 20% of the total population of Louisville and were the seventh largest black community in the nation. Being at the bottom of a wealthy local economy was more advantageous than being at the top of a poor one, and hence most African Americans were employed and some were moderately prosperous. Equally important, the size of Louisville's black population made the black vote significantly more meaningful than in other sections of the state. And finally, a new generation of outstanding black leaders, most notably William H. Stewart, Reverend Charles H. Parrish Sr., and Albert Ernest Mazik learned to leverage those assets to wrest concessions from local white leaders as a testament to their efforts. By 1900, Central Colored High School was perhaps the largest black public school in the United States. The percentage of African American homeowners was higher in Louisville than in any other American city. There were 66 churches, 67 fraternal organizations, boasting 7,500 total members, 12 black women's clubs, 13 physicians, 8 attorneys, 59 ministers, a colored old folks home, a YMCA, and more than 100 teachers in the city. State University offered liberal arts, theological, medical, and legal education. Life in segregated Louisville was not idyllic. Poverty and poor housing were commonplace. Violence, crime, and police were brutality were widespread, but separate was more equal than in most other black communities in the state and nation, and that in itself was an impressive achievement. So, more black studies out of Freedom Park. Here's the largest Confederate monument in the state of Kentucky, the largest Confederate monument here at U of L. It's even more daunting since there are no other monuments uh, for the Union in the state of Kentucky except for in. Uh, Lewis County. So Lewis County has got the only pro-Union monument <laughs> and they said that the Union was always right and the Confederacy was always wrong so fuck you Confederates. There is a Lincoln statue by the uh, downtown library but U of L supporting the very tall phallic symbol of racial bigotry and hatred and slavery and the worst that America has to offer.
because it's all the the Confederates that had killed William Justice Goble, a progressive governor in Kentucky, and also responsible for the genocide of millions of Native Americans on this dark and bloody ground.